I want you to open your Bibles to the 16th chapter of Luke, the 16th chapter of the gospel according to, to St. Luke. And we're going to just take one verse at the moment for a text. Luke's gospel, chapter 16, verse 23. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious holy word. We thank you for the revelation that God's word brings us concerning heaven. But we thank you also for the revelation that God's word brings us concerning hell. Thank God we're heaven bound. But there's are those that in the world particular that are not heaven bound. And we need to reach them. Let them know that there is a heaven to gain and there is a hell to shun. We thank you for giving us interest in the Holy Ghost. We'll give you all praise, honor, and glory for everything that's wrought among us while we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now the word of God said here, and in hell, talking about the rich man, and in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. You know there is a book, I don't know much about it, just heard about it and read a little bit about it, called the Blue Book. Folks of, of that's important, I guess, maybe here in America, are listed in this Blue Book. And it's called Who's Who, you see. Who's Who. Well, I want to talk about who's who in hell. The Word of God tells us that there is a hell. Many people doubt the reality of hell. But in Matthew, the 25th chapter and the 46th verse, it says, and these shall go away into everlasting, notice that, into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. The words in the original language that the Bible is written in that are given concerning hell are the words Gehenna, Sheol, and Hades. Now these just simply are describing the different aspects, so to speak, of hell and of punishment. And uh, you understand this, that Hades, translated hell, means the place of departed spirits. And you understand that when people who are unsaved leave this world, they go into this place where this rich man was, when he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, but that's not their eternal home they're all going to be resurrected and their spirits are going to come back up out of that place. And then they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. I sort of liken it like this, that Hades or hell, uh, and all of it could be termed hell, like this. It, it's just simply the temporary dwelling place. For instance, a criminal here is arrested and he's convicted and put in jail. Well, the jail is not the penitentiary, but it's about the same because he's, he's there. And then he's transported eventually into the penitentiary. Well, you see, when you leave here unsaved, you go down into the place where the rich man was. But you see, they're going to be resurrected too. And their spirits are coming out of that place. And they're going to stand before the great white throne judgment. No, the church will not be at the great white throne judgment. The Bible said that death and hell gave up the dead which were in them. Amen. And they stand before the white throne judgment of God. And the books are open. Uh, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And everyone whose name is not found written in the book of life is cast into the lake. That's the final place. The lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. But you see all of it, we're using it a general term. All of it is hell. All of it is eternal punishment. All of it is separation from God. Now in Mark, the ninth chapter, if you have turned real quickly to the ninth chapter of the Mark in the 43rd through the 48th verse. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter into life main than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It's better for, for thee to enter into halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell in the fire that never shall be quenched where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched and if thy eye offend thee pluck it out 
It's better to thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. You see the word of God talks about that it's better to have your eyes. Now you know he's not talking about just pluck your natural eye out. There are things in the flesh that you just need to cut off. Amen. It'll be better for you to, to go into heaven and into the kingdom of God than to keep it and stay with it and go into hell. And so he talks about then another place of being cast into outer darkness. He talks about where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And then the Lord Jesus Christ himself in the 16th chapter of Luke's gospel told this story in the most minute detail. Luke the 16th chapter from which we took our text began to read with the 19th verse and he said there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fired sumptuously every day and there was a certain beggar laid at his feet full of souls desired to be fed from the crumbs which fell from his table. Moreover the dog came and licked his sword and the beggar died and the angels carried him away to Abraham's bosom and the rich man died and was buried and in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. And Father Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things and now thou art tormented and likewise Lazarus evil and now he's comforted. Beside this is a great guff fix between us and you so that they cannot come from thence to hence. Neither can they come from hence to thence. And then he became concerned this rich man in hell became concerned about his five brothers who were back on the earth. And he said, then send Lazarus, you know, back to the earth that he might witness or testify to my five brothers that they might not come to this place of torment. And Father Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. And if they hear not them, neither will they be persuaded though one arose from the dead. The Bible said in Psalm the ninth chapter, and in the 17th verse, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. I want you to notice that. The wicked shall be turned into hell. Everybody knows that. You know, if there isn't a hell, there ought to be one. There ought to be a place for those that are wicked and mean. And then there is, we're sorry to say, but there is. But now wait just a minute. It says, and all nations that forget God. You see, you don't have to be wicked to miss heaven and go to hell. All you have to do is just forget God. All you have to do is just leave God out of your life. All you have to do is just leave God out of your plans. All you have to do is just leave God out of your marriage. All you have to do is just leave God out of your future. All you have to do is just leave God out of your present. Just forget him, just leave him out and you'll go to hell and you'll split hell wide open just as quick as the worst wretch that ever walked the streets of the city. Amen, amen. And then over in the book of Revelation, in the book of Revelation, the word of God gives us a catalog of those who go to hell. But the fearful, oh my. He starts off not with the sinful, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Amen. Now notice, let's read that catalog again. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars. That means little liars, big liars, white liars, black liars, all liars shall have their part in the lake. That's the final abode, the final hell. In the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Well, the scripture describes that place. These scriptures and tells us who's going there. But let's take the actual Bible list of those who have lived on this planet, those in hell. First of all, I want you to turn with me to the 25th chapter of the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 25, beginning with the first verse. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto 10 virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. 
They were foolish, took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all of those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourself. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready, I want you to notice that word, ready, went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterwards came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. Now many people have taken this and it is just a parable and they've tried to build a doctrine. You can't build a doctrine on any parable. Amen. But you just have to understand that there's just one truth that he's trying to get over. That one truth is given in that verse where I want you to notice where it says, they that were ready, they that were ready. All you can get out of this and don't add anything else to it or you'll be unscriptural. All you can get out of it is he's just simply talking about being ready. Amen, some of them were ready and some of them were not ready. Ready for what? To meet the master. Don't try to build anything else on it. Some folks said, well, now oil's a type of the Holy Ghost and they didn't have all, they didn't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You can't build that on that. That's foolish. And besides that, unscriptural. No, he's just talking about the one thing, being ready. And here were five foolish virgins. No, they were not bad people. They were virgins, beautiful young ladies, virgins, clean, wholesome, but they just weren't ready. There are at least five virgins in hell. While you and I sat here in this well-lighted room, they're there in that darkness and in the torment and the misery where that rich man was when he lifted up his eyes in torment. The only accusation that brought against them was they weren't ready. Are you ready? Thank God I'm ready. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? amen? And then of course there is at least one. I'm sure there are many. But the word of God tells us that there's a rich man in hell. We just got through reading about it in this 16th chapter. Notice that the scripture said there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There's at least one rich man. I'm sure there's more. But I know that there's one there. The Bible tells us about it. A rich man in that awful place because he lift up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus. And he recognized Lazarus as the beggar that laid at his gate begging. And so he said, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water to my tongue for I'm tormented. The word of God said he lift up his eyes being in torment. Hell is a place of torment. There's a rich man in hell. There's a black land farmer in hell. Turn to the 12th chapter of the gospel according to St. Luke. Luke's gospel, chapter 12. The word of God tells us, and he spake a parable unto them saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought with himself saying, what shall I do? because I have no room where to bestow my fruits, or in other words, my goods. 12th chapter of Luke, 16th verse through the 20th verse. And he said, this will I do. I'll pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all of my fruits, or goods, and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And God said unto him, thy fool, thy fool, thy fool. You know, there's not many people in the Bible that God called a fool. But you remember in the Old Testament, God said, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. God calls the man that says there's no God a fool. And then he calls this, this black land farmer a fool. Thy fool, God said to him, thy fool. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? This man's ground brought forth plentiful. 
He, he didn't have space to store his goods, the fruit of his land. He said, I know what I'll do. I'll pull down my barns. And I'll build greater barns. And he did build greater barns. And then he said to himself, so take your ease. Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. You know, that's sort of the attitude of the whole world today. But my brother, sister, God said to him, thy fool. I wonder whom God's speaking to today, saying thy fool. Those folks who are laying up treasures for themselves upon the earth and saying, take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Thy fool this night, thy soul shall be required of thee, and who shall these things be? And so there's a black land farmer in hell, must have been a black land farmer, uh, for his ground to bring forth richly and in all the fruits that it did. Now turn to the book of Revelation. Revelation, the 19th chapter, and the 20th verse. The 19th chapter, and the 20th verse. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worship his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And so there's a prophet in hell. And then the word of God said, you're right there in Revelation, just turn right back to the book just before Revelation, the book of Jude, just one chapter. Notice the sixth verse. And the angels, Jude, verse six, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he has reserved an everlasting change under darkness unto the judgment of the great day and they're going to be cast into that place. And so there'll be fallen angels cast into hell. Now turn to the book of Revelation and notice the 20th chapter and uh, the 10th verse. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever, and Satan himself will eventually be cast into hell, into the lake of fire, where he shall be tormented day and night forever and forever. Now turn back to the 25th chapter of Matthew, please. Matthew chapter 25, we were there just a moment ago. Notice again, Matthew chapter 25. And let's begin to read with the 14th verse. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling in the far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. And he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. So he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I've gained besides them five talents more. And his Lord said unto him, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee rule over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I've gained two other talents besides them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strong. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Remember we read the catalog of those in hell. It headed up with the fearful. And I was afraid, and I went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast, that is thine. 
His Lord answered and said unto him, Thy wicked and slothful servant, thou knowest that I reap where I sowest not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury or interest. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto everyone that, ha that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. Think about that. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. My friends, the Bible at least gives us this who's who, that there are five foolish virgins in hell, that there's a rich man in hell, that there's a prosperous, probably black land farmer in hell, that there will be a prophet in hell, that fallen angels will eventually be there, that Satan himself will eventually be there, and that there is a servant of God in hell. This man here, he said, take it, cast it into the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Amen. I remember I used to, after I was raised up from the bed of sickness and raised up and healed by the power of God in 1934 as a young Baptist boy, and I just had the preach in me. Now I went back to high school because I had missed one year I was bed fast but I'll tell you, I was constantly preaching. Amen, if you've got it in you, I don't understand some of these folks. God called me to preach. And they're just sitting around. Well, there's a difference in sitting around and preaching. I'll tell you, I wasn't but 17 years old and we walked to school. We didn't have school buses and we didn't have any kind. We're talking, I'm talking about 1934, you see. And we didn't have any kind of buses running in the city. We just walked to school. Depression days, little old town of maybe 10,000 or 11,000, 12,000 people, uh, and there's not all that much traffic because folks just don't have cars and automobiles like they do today. And I mean, a bunch of us would just walk down the middle of the street. We'd get over if we had to, but sometimes we'd walk a mile and never meet a car and just walk down the middle of the street. Well, I didn't just go along and push something off on somebody, but if somebody give me a knee, I mean, if they opened the door just to crack, I stuck my foot in it and start preaching to them. And then we'd get to school and you couldn't go in school until the bell rang, the doors were locked. And at a certain time, and it, it, old fashioned school, high steps, you know. But you see, they'd ask me questions and that'd give me an opportunity. I'd get up on those steps nearly every morning and preach to them. Praise God forevermore. Somebody said, you can't do that today. Well, I'd still do it today. If folks asked me, I'd answer them. Amen. Somebody said, they put you in jail. Well, I'd preach to them in jail. Glory to God, hallelujah, amen. If the preach is in you, you just gotta preach. Amen, you can't stop a preacher from preaching anymore, you can stop a rooster from crowing. It's just as natural for a preacher to preach as it is for a rooster to crow. Amen, praise God. And sometime in those days were depression days, you know, 34, 35, mid-depression day, no work. I mean, the streets are full of, you could have a street service every day because men's got nothing to do. They're just standing around on the streets. The streets are full of people. I mean, it's like it is, you know, on a real busy trade day, like Saturday or something, you know. I mean, they're there. Well, I'd just walk up to somebody sometimes on the street and I'd say, did you know? I mean, just a stranger, didn't even know. But did you know that I'd know there's a hell if I didn't have a Bible? They'd look at me and say, how'd you know? And I told them this story. And you know, while I'm a talking, folks would just keep coming. I mean, they're getting around to hear me. Before you know it, I got the whole street nearly blocked. Praise God. Here's a story right in my own hometown. You see, and I'm standing on the courthouse square telling the story, and they, they knew because they lived there. I said, well, I'm right over here at 405 North College Street, and I had today in the city of McKinney, Texas, and this is 34 and 35, but you see, this is 1933, so it was just the year before to them. I said, Saturday night, Saturday night, 7.30, 405 North College Street in the south bedroom, just as grandpa's old clock struck 7.30, 
my heart stopped. I was lying in bed. I'd been sick all the week. In fact, I'd been sickly all my life. Never ran and prayed like other little children. Well, limitedly, but not fully. And, and, and the doctors had been called. Doctors made house calls. But Dr. Wysong, old Dr. W.S. Wysong Sr., he was over at the hospital. Well, they contacted him there, and he said he'd come to our house as soon as he got through at the hospital, making his calls. So they're waiting for him to come. And Grandpa's clock struck 7.30. My heart stopped. Faster than I can tell you, the circulation cut all the way down the end of my, my toes just suddenly, like your feet go to sleep, they just went numb. Faster than I can tell it. My toes, my feet, my ankles, my knees, my hips, my stomach. And I leaped out of my body like a man would leap off of a diving board into a swimming pool. I leaped out of my body and I began to descend like you're going down in a well or in a cavern. I could look back up and see the lights of the earth above me because they put off a certain amount of light. I remember later on my mother, my grandmother, and my younger brother, who was nine years of age, all said to me, because I said goodbye to them, I knew I was already going down in the pit when I said goodbye. But they all three said later on, when you said goodbye, it sounded like you was away down in a well or something. Well, I had it in my mind to say goodbye, and I leaped out too fast, and so when I did say goodbye, evidently my voice picked it up. And they said, uh, you sound like you was away down in a well. And so I'm descending, feet first, descending, down, 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 until the lights of the earth faded away from above me, until darkness encompassed me around about. Darkness is so dark, you couldn't see your hand if it was one inch in front of your face. Darkness, it was so dense that it seemed if you had a knife, you could just cut a chunk of it out. And the further down you went, the darker and the hotter it became floating down feet first till finally way down beneath me on the wall of darkness. I can see fingers of light playing on the wall of darkness. And in a few seconds, seemed like an eternity, but it had to be only a few moments. I came to the bottom of the pit. When I came to the bottom of the pit, see the word of God we read it talks about being cast into outer darkness where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and talks about fire and talks about torment. Different kind of fire, of course, you understand, than what we know of a fire in a stove or something like that. But you can see great white crest, great orange flames with a white looking crest. When I came to the bottom of the pit, there was some kind of a creature that met me. I never looked at it. I knew he was there. Just like I can look straight ahead if I'm standing here without looking and out of the corner of my eye, at least see the pulpit that's there. Uh, the reason I didn't look was that we approached the gates into hell itself. We came to the bottom of the pit and then there's just an incline that goes down further. And, and, and you're floating towards those gates. And some way or another you knew that once you went through those gates you couldn't come back. But that creature, when we came to the gates, I endeavored to slow my descent down and did to some extent. And that creature took me by the arm. Now I didn't know till years later that the word of God says in the book of Isaiah, hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee. And so that creature met me. But thank God when he put his hand on my arm to escort me in, there was a voice that spoke away above the darkness away above that place. I don't know what he said. It was not spoken in the English language. It was a foreign tongue to me. And I don't know what he said or how many words he spoke. There may have been a half a dozen, there may have been nine, 10 or 12 words. But whatever was spoken, when those words were spoken, that whole place just shook like there was an earthquake on. That creature took his hand off of my back there was like a suction to my back part and I came floating back away from the gates of hell, floating back. And then I came up, head first, floating up. I could see the lights of the earth before I came to the top of the pit. Then I came up on the porch outside the south bedroom. I could see the giant cedar trees there in the yard. 
I could see grandpa's porch swing there on the porch. And then I seemed to just come right through the wall and jump inside my body like a man would slip his foot inside of his boot in the morning time. And when I got back inside my body, then I said to my grandmother, my voice, this natural voice picked up the word. I said, Granny, I'm going again and I won't come back. She said, son, I thought you weren't coming back that time. I said, where's mama? I want to tell her goodbye. She said, I told your mother that you were gone. And so she rushed outside praying. We live in one of those old fashioned houses like they used to build in this part of the country of the porch, you know, nearly all the way around it. And she was over on the north side. I heard her then coming around to the south side, praying at the top of her voice. And I said, Granny, my grandmother said, I'll go get her. And I said, well, I want to tell her goodbye. And so she got up because she was holding me in her arms. She laid my head on the pillow and, and started to leave and I grabbed a hold of her. Some way or another, you want somebody with you. When you come to cross over, you want somebody with you. And you see, I was afraid. And, and, and so I got a hold of her and I pulled her back and I said, no, Granny, don't leave me, don't leave me, don't leave me. Well, thank God we won't have to cross Jordan alone. Hallelujah. Because Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Did you notice the story here that we read about the rich man and beggar? The word of God says that there was a certain rich man that's clothed in purple and fine linen and fair and sumptuous every day. And there was a certain beggar laid at his gate full of sores of desiring to be fed from the crumbs which fell on his table. More were the dogs came and licked his sores and the beggar died and the angels, the angels, the angels, the angels, the angels, the angels, even in the Old Testament, they didn't have to cross Jordan alone. You know what I mean? The angels carried him away. The angels carried him away. But blessed be God now under the new covenant, Jesus himself. The first martyr, you remember the seventh chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, the word of God tells us about Stephen that was stoned to death and that when he died, he said, I see heaven open and Jesus standing on the right hand of the Father. Glory to God. Glory to God. No, you won't have to cross Jordan alone. But you, when you don't know him, when you don't know him, you're afraid. When you don't know him, you're afraid. When you don't know him, you're afraid. And so uh, I was afraid. I was a church member, but I didn't know him. And I was afraid. And I, so I said, Granny, 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 don't leave me. Don't leave me. And so she came back. Well, actually, she called out. She took again and run her arm under my head and shoulders and held me in her arms. And she called my mother. But she couldn't make her hear. Though she yelled quite loudly, she couldn't make her hear because she was, my mother was praying so loud she couldn't hear anything. And so I just simply said to her, tell mama I said goodbye. Tell mama I said I love her. Tell mama I said I appreciate her. Staying with we children when my daddy forsook us when I was just six years old. Tell mama I appreciate her trying to make a living for four children until she finally had a complete nervous, physical, and mental breakdown. And, and I said, tell mama that I said, if I've ever put a wrinkle in her face or a gray hair in her head, I'm sorry. I asked her to forgive me. Tell mama I said goodbye. And then I said, granny, when mama's health failed, I came to live with my grandmother on my mother's side when I was nine years old. And you've been a second mother to me. And I appreciate that. And my grandmother would also always say, my granny would always say, kiss me right there, kiss me right there. And so I kissed her on the cheek and my heart stopped. And, and I felt the circulation cut off way down at the end of my toes, faster than you can say it, ankles, knees, stuff, hip, hip, stomach, and out I leaped, out of my body. Down I went till the lights of the earth above me faded away. Down, 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 down. I know it was only a few seconds, but it seemed like an eternity. I know it happened 50 some odd years ago, but it seemed like it happened last Saturday night. It's just as real as it happened to me last night. Spiritual things never grow old. Down until the darkness encompassed me around about until you couldn't see your hand if it's one inch in front of your face. And the further down you went, the harder it became until finally down beneath you, you saw fingers of light playing on the walls of darkness and you came to the bottom of the pit. And then there's an incline that goes down further and down you floated towards those gates. I can see them yet. Once you go through those gates, I knew I couldn't come back. I slowed down my descent 
That same creature met me. That same creature put, put his hand on my arm, right arm, to escort me in. And thanks be unto God, there was a voice that spoke. It was a male voice, not a female or woman, a man's voice. What he said, I don't know. It was a strange tongue. But when he spoke, that whole place shook like there's an earthquake on. And that creature took his hand off of my arm. And there was like a magnet would have pulled you to my back. I just came floating backwards, just floating backwards until I got back to the bottom of the pit. And then I came floating up. And the only difference was the first time I came up on the porch outside the, of the room, south bedroom, the second time I came up at the foot of the bed for just a second, fast you snap your finger. I could see my body lying there on the bed. I could see my grandmother, she held me in her arms and I leaped from the foot of the bed inside my body through my mouth like a man would slip his foot inside of his boot in the morning time and I got backside my body and we say in the world and so I said, to Granny, I'm going again and the third time's charm. I won't be back. And again, she said, son, I didn't think you was coming back that time. And I said, where's grandpa? I'm gonna tell him goodbye. She said, son, you know, granddad went down to the end, down the east part of town to collect rent from some of his houses. And I said, oh, I knew that. I'd forgotten that. But I said, tell grandpa, I said goodbye. Tell grandpa I love him. Tell grandpa I appreciate him. When I had no home, he gave me one. He's the only daddy I've ever known. Tell him I love him. Tell him goodbye. I left a word for my sister, only sister, uh, and, and then my two brothers, and my heart stopped. And, and, and the circulation cut off. And I leaped out of my body. And I began to descend. And I'll be honest with you, I thought till this third time, th you know, this isn't real, it's just an hallucination. Uh, this can't be right. But as I went down through that darkness, I was afraid. I cried out in the darkness, God, I belong to the church. I've been baptized in water. I'm trying to tell him I shouldn't be going this way. I listened for an answer. There was no answer. Only the sound of my own voice as it echoed through the darkness. You ever been in Carl's bad caverns or any caverns and shout out something? Your voice will come ricocheting back, so to speak, to you. And so then again, the second time I cried a little louder, God, I belong to the church. I've been baptized in water. I listened for an answer, but there's no answer. And the third time, if I could do it just the way I did it, I'd scare you out of your wits. I literally screamed, God, 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 I belong to the church. I've been baptized in water, but there's no answer. I believe in belonging to the church. I believe in being baptized in water. But my friends, it'll take more than that for you to miss hell and go to heaven. You must be born again. You must know Jesus as your own personal Lord and Savior. Amen. And so the third time I came to the bottom of the pit and the third time that creature met me and the third time, thanks be unto God, that voice spoke and who, who, whatever it was he said, it worked. That creature took his hand off my arm. I came floating back. I came floating up. As I came up through the darkness, I began to pray. You see, that inward man's the real man, the spirit man. And I began to call on God in the name of Jesus to save me and to forgive me and to cleanse me. And the only difference was, first time I came up on the porch, the second time at the foot of the bed, the third time right beside the bed, leaped right inside my body. When I got back inside my body, my natural voice picked up my prayer right in the middle of a sentence. And I continued to pray so loud. Now, this is 1933, 22nd day of April, Saturday night. And we live just, just about a block and a half off of what they call Millionaire Row. That's the richest people in town live there. And folks tell me that traffic was blocked. You didn't have all the traffic in those days you have today. But you see, this is a better part of town and more people had automobiles. They tell me that traffic was blocked from two blocks around from every side of our house. Me and mama was praying so loud. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Somebody said, was you scared? You better bet you were scared. Amen. Amen. We prayed so loud. We brought traffic for two blocks around. But thanks be unto God. Hallelujah. It felt to me like a two-ton weight rolled off of my chest. And I was born again. And I looked at the clock on Grandpa's mantelpiece. And it said 20 minutes till 8 o'clock. And all of that happened in 10 minutes. Now you can understand why. If you've been in any of our crusades, if you've been in any of our meetings, 
You understand why every single time I give an altar call, every single time I call attention to the people, there is a hell to shun. There is a heaven to gain. Amen, and I pray that God will help them to know that and to understand that. Did you notice that the word of God said the fearful? I was afraid to begin with. The, the catalog of those in hell, it begins with the list of the fearful, the fearful, and then second, the unbelieving. I never will forget, here's a sequel to what I'm talking about. When I was bedfast, uh, my grandmother had a cousin. We lived in McKinney, just 32 miles north of McKinney, Texas, was another county seat of the county where my wife was born, the city of Sherman in Grayson County. And, and, and my grandmother had lived in McKinney and her cousin had lived in Sherman 32 miles away in Texas for 35 years and didn't know any kin folks was close. They came from Tennessee uh, originally, you see, out to Texas, way back there, the forebears did. But eventually, even through contact with some other kin folks, they found out that here a cousin is living just 32 miles away. So they got in contact with one another and they'd go to visit one another occasionally. And when I was bed fast, Aunt Liza, as we called her, along with her daughter, Lorena, would come to visit us. Now, you didn't mention God. You see, uh, the, the last time I'd seen, I guess, she was over 60 years of age, somewhere in her, around 60, I guess. And, and so she said, uh, but you didn't mention God to her. I, I mean, her, her daughter would just get her stopped some way or another. She'd just start ranting and rave. Every preacher ought to be shot. Why, there is no God. Why, when you're, when you're dead, you're just dead like a dog. There is no God, there is no heaven, there is no hell. Every preacher ought to be shot. Every church house ought to be burned down. They're just fooling people, getting the money out of them. They're just in it for their money and ranting and raving. Their daughter would get up sometimes and you know, just get to working with her and finally get her to shut up, you know, and get the conversation off something else so, so we'd learn through the year. Don't, don't ever bring up the subject of God or the Bible or Jesus or anything to ain't lies because she'll just go to ranting and raving. Well, I was healed then, 1934, and in the year 1934, she'd come to visit us every once in a while, sit in the sick room with the rest of them because they'd sit in there to visit so I could get in on it. And so in the process of time then, uh, about 10 years later, so she must have been about 62, about 10 years later during World War Number 2, my wife and I were out on the field in field ministry holding revival meetings, going from church to church. And, and my wife's folks lived in Sherman and between meetings sometime we'd go and stay with them. Sometime the grandparents would keep uh, the, the children because you know they were younger, not in school yet. They'd get tired of traveling, like to stay with grandma. Uh, but anyway, we were in and my mother-in-law said uh, to me uh, and, and dad-in-law, uh, because the daughter had married. She's about 30 years old before she got married. Said, you know, so-and-so, Lorena. Yeah, yeah. Well, said, uh, she said, if Kenneth comes, get, have him to come. Have him to come to see us. And so uh, it's important. And so on. And there was, seemed to be such an urgency about it until we got the address. And my wife and I, she was with me, knocked on the door. The door opened. And I recognized Lorena, but of course she hadn't seen me since last time she saw me. I was bed fast, weighed 89 pounds. And so I told her, I said, I'm Kenneth. Oh, she said, Kenneth. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. Opened the door then. The door was open, but unhooked the screen, you see. And shook hands with me. And shook hands with my wife. I introduced me, this is my wife. And she said, she took one of my hands in both of hers and began to cry. I said, oh, Kenneth, Kenneth, Kenneth. The reason I wanted you to come said, please talk to mama. Uh, now, Lorena had become converted and born again, child of God. And she said, you know how mama was? You just don't mention God to her. I said, yeah. She said, she's here in the bedroom, in a, in a hospital bed in, at home. The doctor just left a few moments ago. She's in a coma. If we can stir her up, would you talk to her, please? Would, would you talk to her? And the doctor said she won't recover. Seventy some odd years old now. And I said, well, surely I will if I can. I said, I sure will. And so she led me, both of my hands, uh, or my one hand and both of hers, up to a door, took one hand, opened the door, my wife followed, and we went inside. And there this dear woman, 70 something odd years old, lying there on the hospital bed. You looked at her, her eyes were open, but they looked like marbles. Her mouth open, but there's a rattle in her throat, struggling for breath, death upon her. Doctors just left some minutes before and said she'll not come out of it. Lorena souped over and said, Mama, Mama. There's no, no sign. Her eyes didn't blink, they're just open. 
They never did blink. Mama, no sound. Hollered a little louder. In her ear, Mama, no sound. Shook her a little bit and got down there and said, Mama, Mama, Mama. Somewhere or another, her mouth open, stayed open all the time, never did shut it. Somewhere or another, way down inside, she said, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. I understand, she said, what is it? She said, this is Lorena. She out of somewhere or another down inside, she said, yeah, my baby. Never, never moved her lips, just somewhere or another, way down in my way, uh-huh. She said, Mama, you remember Aunt Sally and her daughter Lily? And you remember Lily's boy that was bed fast so long? Kenneth, the one that made the preacher? When she said preacher, she never batted her eyes, but she raised up. Her mouth still open, but she made an effort to raise up and Lorena helped her. And she reached her hand and said, Ken, Ken, where are you? Where are you? Where are you, Ken? Where are you? I took her hand. She said, oh, Ken. Oh, Ken. Ken. I said, I said there was no God. I said there's no hell. You're a preacher. Tell me there's not any hell. Tell me there's not any hell. I'm so afraid. It's dark. It's dark. It's so dark. It's so dark. I'm so afraid. It's so dark. You're a preacher. You ought to know. Tell me there's not any hell. But I couldn't tell her there's not any hell. I was going to tell her there's a heaven and she can go there. But she exhausted what strength she had and fell back on the pillow under unconsciousness and died and went to hell. And while we were in this well-lighted room enjoying the pleasures of this life, that poor dear soul is down there in the dark crying out, why didn't I listen? The fearful and the unbelieving will be turned into hell where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Every head bowed, every eye closed. One of these days, it may not be long, we're everyone gonna leave here. There is a hell to shun. There is a heaven to gain. Dear Father God, as we wait in your presence, per adventure there's a man or a woman, a young man or a young woman that's lost, that's unsaved, that's on the road to hell. I ask you right now, speak to their hearts by your Holy Spirit. Help them to know there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. May they come to Jesus and be saved and make heaven. Dear Father God, should there be those like a church member but not saved? Oh, Father God, speak to that dear church member's heart. Help them to know there's a new birth. Help them to know they can be born again and come to know the Lord Jesus Christ personally and as their own personal Savior. Oh, dear Father, should there be those that have known the Lord, that have been in fellowship with him and in Father's house. We call them backsliders. But like the prodigal son of old, who was in his father's house, who was in fellowship with his father, but he left and went away from him. And he went out into the practice of sin and wrongdoing. Speak to that prodigal son. Speak to that prodigal daughter by your Holy Spirit that they may like the prodigal son of old arise and come back home and say, Father, I've sinned against you, forgive me. Oh, Father, dear Father, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that not one single person will miss heaven and die and go to hell, but may every single person under the sound of my voice make heaven their home. I ask it in Jesus' name. For more information about Kenneth Hagen Ministries, call 1-888-283-2484 or visit our website at rhema.org or write Kenneth Hagen Ministries, P.O. Box 50126, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74150-0126. And in Canada, 
visit rhemacanada.org or write Kenneth Hagen Ministries, P.O. Box 335, Station D, Etobicoke, Ontario, Canada, M9A 4X3.